Um, Dr. Malefa gets her as professor and chair, Department of Africology and African American Studies at Temple University in Philadelphia. He also serves as international organizer for Afrocentricity International and is a president of the Malefi Keta Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies. Asante is a guest professor at Zhejiang University, Hangzhou, China, and Professor Chaudhonet at the University of South Africa. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Professor Asante. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I am extremely uh, delighted. Uh, to speak with you uh, in this forum. And I understand that you have been going for uh, maybe several years. It's a wonderful thing. And I'm delighted uh, on behalf of uh, myself, but also my, my department at Temple University, which is the first uh, university to have a PhD in Africology and African American Studies. Uh, we are truly, truly happy uh, that uh, we always get a chance to at least uh, raise questions that sometimes are rarely raised. There are two propositions that I start with uh, today, and I want to um, uh, share those with you uh, as we speak. Uh, the first one is that uh, the racial ladder must be destroyed because it distorts homo sapiens reality. That is the first proposition. The second proposition is that the racial ladder has supported most European constructions of knowledge by ignoring uh, Africa or Africa's uh, achievements. Um, and this has also uh, absolutely been the case uh, with the Pan-European Academy uh, as defined by Chen Weizhou, who has argued that uh, in the West, what we have is a pan-European academy uh, with its own um, international uh, guardians and deans and guardrails and protocols and uh, regulations that substantially uh, emphasize a white, uh, cultural and racial supremacy and ignores Africa and the rest of the world. It was also the case, uh, it has also been the case, not just with the West. I mean, Marxism had that problem very early on uh, and uh, Lenin ex expressly expressed it. Uh, and many African-Americans who uh, had early on uh, join the Communist Party in the early part of the 20th century uh, uh, felt uh, a, a need to express uh, their alienation around the questions of nation and the question of culture. Uh, and uh, these uh, issues uh, that are situated by the two propositions that I have mentioned uh, have been problematic. Uh, and they're problematic for not just African cultural spaces, uh, but they are uh, problematic uh, in uh, assuming uh, the so-called um, uh, that the so-called developmental stages of Europe uh, represent a universal pattern of development. And that is not just uh, in terms of material uh, development but also in terms of epistemological development. Some people have taken the false idea that there is a lack of productive information from African culture uh, as a part of their uh, worldview. And I assert that we need a new ethic of relations. And I assert also uh, that uh, the Ideas that have been offered, whether postmodernism or decoloniality, for example, uh, have, have offered us routes uh, to establishing new relations, but uh, without an assertive Afrocentricity, uh, these are going almost, uh, have gone nowhere uh, in terms of dealing with the Pan-European Academy 
a few years ago, I was invited to a conference in Penang in Malaysia, in which we discuss uh, the decolonizing of the uh, universities. And in that uh, conference, uh, I uh, explored the idea of uh, human knowledge uh, being derived very early on uh, uh, by Homo sapiens who originated on the continent of Africa and spent three fourths of the time of Homo sapiens on the earth inside Africa. In other words, uh, not until 70,000 years ago did uh, Homo sapiens migrate out of Africa. And of course, all, all Homo sapiens did migrate out of Africa, but, but the, the migration uh, to the rest of the world began about 70,000 years ago, even though we know that uh, Homo sapiens have been around about 300,000 years. So uh, the question becomes, certainly to those of us who think about it, uh, what happened to Homo sapiens uh, during the uh, uh, 230,000 years that Homo sapiens lived on the continent of Africa? I mean, what were people thinking about? I mean, what did they do? How did they form uh, societies and relationships? Who established ideas of kinship? Who uh, looked at the stars and named them? Uh, who uh, uh, domesticated uh, the cow? Uh, who uh, first uh, decided how to uh, forge a stream to, to, to go across a river. I mean, all these things had to be worked out, uh, including uh, how humans live with each other and how humans spoke of each other and how humans uh, uh, had uh, interactions with each other. Uh, these things had to be worked out uh, before uh, we, uh, the, the migration out of Africa. It would seem to me that that is uh, possible, you see? So um, uh, part of what has happened to us as uh, modern uh, scholars or people who are investigating knowledge and information is that we have a truncated sense of human knowledge. And this uh, notion of human knowledge, beginning with Homer, for example, or with the Greeks, uh, has devastated uh, uh, human thinking and has created corruption almost in every uh, theory, uh, almost any episteme that you think about in terms of the Western uh, field of knowledge. And this has rarely been questioned. I, I mean, it seems to me that um, Afrocentricity, which emerged in the 1980s and was, of course, hotly contested uh, uh, by those who felt threatened by the questions that were raised by it, um, really has been, in my judgment, the only uh, episteme that has really uh, challenged uh, the cocoon that has become uh, the Pan-European Academy. And this is, this is really a pro this is really a, um, this is a profound problem in knowledge and in not just knowledge production, but in uh, our understanding of ourselves as homo sapiens. So, so, um, so for me, and I'm raising this question this way because uh, for me, uh, the problem with this uh, uh, condition that we find ourselves in as intellectuals is that we are uh, running around in the same arena over and over again, thinking that when we see uh, something that's a little different, that perhaps we have finally found a way out of this arena that we are stuck in, uh, and we have not. <clears throat> Now, um, uh, I, I want to talk probably a little bit about postmodernism and then a little bit about postcoloniality, uh, and then offer some Afrocentric uh, uh, ways of adjustment to this. Um, and maybe I should start with, with postmodernism because 
Uh, I think as a graduate student at the University of California, for me, uh, I grew up uh, in the era when postmodernism was extremely uh, popular. It was, of course, uh, what we all uh, were, were engaged in uh, to some degree. I mean, I was also engaged quite heavily in the, um, the, the anti-apartheid movement and uh, the uh, uh, civil rights uh, uh, movement uh, uh, during that era as well. And all these things sort of converged and uh, the work of uh, certainly the writings of Frantz Fanon uh, and, uh, and we also saw them, of course, as I will point out in, in other writers as well. Uh, Amilcar Cabral, for example, and, and so on. Uh, so postmodernism, as we all probably know, is considered a response to modernism. And it, it thrust us into I call what I call the discourses of uh, uncertainty, of fluidity. And uh, that is why one of the uh, uh, Afrocentrists, Portuguese Afrocentrists, the late Ana uh, Ferreira has uh, been able to critique uh, postmodernism with Afrocentricity in her book, uh, The Demise of the Inhuman. And uh, using um, Leotard's concept of the inhuman, uh, she takes time to demonstrate that we can only bring about the demise of the inhuman through engagement with the truth of human reality. And this truth of human reality is really uh, something that has escaped uh, Western, uh, the Western Academy, uh, only because the Western Academy was defined or defines itself in relationship uh, to Europe uh, being sort of the universal pattern, the universal model. And if you accept that uh, Europe is a universal model, uh, and you uh, are uh, proscribed by that, then there's almost nothing outside of it. In fact, you don't even have to ask, raise questions about China, China or India or any, any I mean, uh, any other uh, culture or civilization. Um, and certainly you don't raise any question about knowledge before Homer and the Greeks. And if you give Homer a date around 800 BCE, before the Christian era, uh, then as an African scholar and an Afrocentrist, you ask the question, uh, what, uh, what happened before 800 BCE? I mean, the pyramids were completed around 2600 BCE. And, and that's much further back than Homer's uh, Iliad and uh, you know the Odyssey. So, so if anything is the um, the magnet for our understanding of knowledge in the in the ancient world and antiquity, uh, particularly in terms of what we have as written information, then the pyramid would be the central uh, 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 document. Of, the, of antiquity. And if the pyramid is the central document of antiquity, whether you're talking geometry or uh, astronomy or um, uh, chemistry or physiology um, or writing, um, if that's the truth of the matter, and it seems historically that that is certainly the case in relationship to the Greeks, then uh, we have been led down a false path. And not only have we been led down a false path, uh, our path has been short, much too short, made much too short. Um, and, and of course, that means uh, that's a problem for our knowledge because after all, Imhotep, uh, who was the uh, the black founder uh, and creator and 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 developer uh, an architect 
for the first pyramid uh, is a name that is far more significant in terms of human knowledge than Homa. So, so I raise this because these are, uh, people say they are contentious, but they're not contentious. Uh, they're just uh, enlightened uh, or in darkened information. It's the information that you don't normally get. And whether you are in, in school in the, in the UK or the United States or even in South Africa. So, and I'm, I mentioned South Africa too, because I, I'm in South Africa quite frequently. And two years ago, before COVID, uh, I flew to uh, Impumalanga to go and visit um, uh, the uh, place of the stones where you have, of course, uh, the oldest human construction that we probably have on the earth uh, in Zala Ilanga, uh, place of the rising sun. And it, it's uh, suspected that it's over 100,000 years old. And you ask yourself a question when you see it, as I did. I just made a special trip there with my friend, uh, Simpiwe Sisanti, uh, to ask yourself the question, where is this in the uh, record of human knowledge and information, construction, architecture? Who, who has done this? I mean, who's looked at this and so forth? So you have to ask these questions only to get at an engagement with the truth of human reality. Otherwise, you are locked into this box, this cocoon, that we all are debating about and we get engaged in it. And then we, we find that we can't, we can't get out of it. And perhaps we've forgotten the lessons that being human, uh, 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 I mean, the lessons that have always given, been given to us by the experiences of humanity. In effect, we have often, I think, violated the very basis of our humanity. And hence, uh, we are today, in some senses, as far away as we, are, we were 100 years ago in this country, in the United States, with the Red Summer of 1919, which saw the epitome of the lynching of Black people in this country. We're not so far away from it 200 years ago, when in 1821, Africans in the United States were being so badly uh, 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 dealt with uh, those Africans who were free, who were not enslaved, that they decided they wanted to move to Liberia. So, so what, what are we engaged in? I mean, uh, I think the suspicion betrayed by uh, two movements, by the postmodern one and the postcolonial one, is that we are held hostage by an imaginary construction, a mental imprisonment that is being uh, now breached by many of the people that uh, you could refer to, and I'm one of them as prisoners. Uh, take postmodernism again, for example, uh, it, because it achieved its height, as I told you during the time that I was a student at UCLA. And 60s and 70s uh, with uh, European authors such as uh, Foucault, uh, Lyotard, uh, Derrida, uh, Althusser. Uh, and there, there was something valuable in the movement. And I, I recognize that as a young person uh, that, uh, and I was sort of happy in a way about some of it because it was, it seemed to me at that time uh, with a young mind that, um, that they were in effect really going to take down this whole regime of white racial hegemony that had dominated education. And of course, alas, I was, I was uh, disappointed uh, the Afrocentrist uh, Ferreira uh, uh, stated, uh, I think, in a, in a wonderful way uh, about this, uh, this situation. She said, um, 
the conceptual rigidity of a hegemonic European sense of truth and history whose superordained structure, not even the Marxist revolution could disrupt, was in fact shaken by the radically emancipating activities of the feminist agenda, civil rights movement, and so forth. And, I, and we felt that. We felt that perhaps for the first time, uh, women would uh, at least bring us some in uh, some some new venture that would challenge the very structure that had created the oppressive hierarchy, the patriarchy that they were living under. And again, we were disappointed that the white women, certainly in the Western world, uh, did not see that. Uh, uh, reality as a part of, of what they were engaged in. Uh, they, in turn, of course, adopted uh, that uh, structure that had already been established. So the postmodernists have generally taken uh, in, in what we have called an anti-modern stance. And that's a good thing because they, they are against, uh, as we know, the the grand narrative, the Western grand narrative, uh, which has always uh, emphasized that when you look back at it, uh, this the supremacy of reason, uh, universal truth, uh, and perhaps the uh, coming of human happiness and progress by virtue of reason and truth. And of course, the definitions of reason and truth uh, by Europe have always been self-interested. Uh, I've always uh, taught my students, and I, I always believe, I really do uh, quite strongly, uh, that postmodernism in the West uh, is nothing more than really the, an extension of the totalizing ideas of Western modernity. With a new face, with a new face, and, and, and with a new face, because when in the 60s and 70s, we thought we were getting something new, they called it the new world order. And sometimes they would even say the new world information order. Uh, but this new world order, for example, uh, which is passe now in a sense, because what people discovered was it was simply uh, the extension of the old world order, you see? So, so how to get from postmodernism to anti-modernism reminds me of the coming debate um, uh, that we, or the debate that we're having now all over Africa. I mean, I uh, was at UNISA uh, maybe three years ago um, and uh, was asked to uh, speak uh, to the entire faculty of UNISA about uh, Afrocentricity. Uh, and it was uh, one of the most powerful uh, his uh, intellectual experiences I've, I've ever had because I spoke to every faculty, the faculty of law, uh, the source of sciences, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. And each day I would go to a different faculty and we would spend two or three hours talking about how to uh, actually uh, re-examine knowledge from the standpoint of African people as being subjects, not victims, not on the margins of Europe, not on the periphery of China, not on the uh, cusp of something else, but, but African people interrogating themselves, interrogating their own history, our condition historically and our condition materially and what we have seen and, and to approach it from an agency point of view, African people as agents and, and, and not mere uh, spectators to, to knowledge. After all, uh, uh, homo sapiens arise in, in Africa and after all, the first civilizations are African. So 
if Homo sapiens arose in Africa, the first civilizations of Africa, the question has to be, um, what then were the forming ideas of those people, those societies? And we, we normally say uh, in the Western tradition that these were prehistoric times. And when you say prehistoric, that means that, well, let's not even go there. <laughs> you know, we, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, writing as defined in, by the West. But um, I've been in many of the caves and under the ledges in South Africa and Zimbabwe where I lived for a time. And I've w walked up in uh, Dombashawa and seen uh, the writing of African people, the people on the continent, uh, 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 many thousands of years ago, long before the pyramids. And you, 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 you ask yourself the question, how do we get uh, the idea that there is not writing, that human beings are not communicating with each other, that they are not entertaining themselves through uh, signs and symbols. I mean, how, wh who who made this? Who made this separation, and why? These are the, the the questions that have to be raised, and they they have only been raised, it seems to me, by the Afrocentrists. And I was I'm very happy that Dr. Nada is here, because uh, her book African Mothers, for example. Uh, uh, was uh, one of the very earliest books to emphasize the role of the African woman uh, at the very beginning and the very heart of uh, understanding how human societies are put together. Um, and uh, the other idea, contribution that she's given is the idea of ma'aticity based on the ancient concept of ma'at that was at the heart of what African people understood by how you live together with people. How, how do we live together without killing each other? I mean, there had to be a miracle to that, not a miracle, but uh, there had to be a human achievement. There had to be a great achievement to live together. I mean, because if, as we say, and as we know that early human beings on the continent of Africa uh, had to establish certain protocols uh, of life so that we could uh, uh, live with each other and share with each other, then we had to understand that uh, that had to be based on something. And what was it based on? The, the furthest back we can go is the concept that, that, uh, that uh, truth and righteousness and justice and order and harmony and balance and reciprocity would provide you with this. But not only that, African people knew, even on, on, when I say African people, I mean the early homo sapiens in Africa knew, I mean, even if you take um, um, the question of uh, difference, which is uh, of course very big in the conversation today, the question of difference, I mean, uh, Africans knew that uh, human beings uh, came in all forms and shapes. Some were lighter than others. Some were darker than others. Uh, some uh, had, uh, some were tall, some were short, but Africa never, never in antiquity is there a place where Africa saw difference in terms of the ranking of human beings. Think about that. That for, as far as we know, for at least the time that African people were living solely only in one continent, or human beings were living on one continent, what was at work was ma'aticity. That is the search for order and balance and harmony and justice and truth and righteousness, and reciprocity had to be a search for how do we live with each other? But it was the imposition of ranking on humans and rating of humans by, uh, by imposing one's uh, imagination, 
this imaginary racial ladder that I have spoken of earlier becomes the, the biggest, biggest problem, you see. So, so, so this, the, the, the modernists posited the liberty and equality as something uh, that was real, but, but the, uh, the postmodernists saw that, that these things were not grounded in human conditions as we, we know it. I mean, you can talk about liberty and equality and uh, these are ideals and, and we may think of them as worthy ideas and worthy objectives, but they are nevertheless ideals. And, 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 and this, I think, is a contribution of postmodernism to point that out. Although from an Afrocentric point of view, we see that it is, uh, that, Afro, that, that uh, postmodernism is, is elusive itself as a concept. I mean, we postmodernists say that equality and reason, these things are elusive and liberty, these are elusive, but, but uh, postmodernism as a concept is elusive. And um, uh, you, you, one could say that we knew where the modernists were, but the, but the uh, ambiguity and the fluidity and uncertainty of postmodernism uh, often appears to me like a fleeting feeling in the brain. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I don't. Yes, I see it. No, I don't. But, but it prevailed in our thinking with the breaking down of the totalitarian regime of modernism. And I'm happy about that. And I'm happy about its demise, its collapse, but it remains in many guises. So, so that's, that's the, the one thing that postmodernism did. I, I may come back to that, but let me just say this a, a, little, a little bit about postcolonialism uh, and, uh, and also, uh, 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 probably a little bit about decoloniality, uh, because postcolonialism uh, refers uh, to the effects of uh, colonization on culture and society. And decolonization uh, refers to the taking down of all forms of uh, colonial power. So, uh, but, but they, they often consider it different from, uh, uh, decoloniality, and um, I, I know uh, a big uh, 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 issue right now in uh, South Africa and some of the universities is this whole debate over decoloniality and Afrocentricity. And I, I don't. I think that uh, there are certain ways in which uh, these ideas may uh, certainly uh, converge, and that there are certain kinds of things that they're trying to, to get at. Um, I probably would not use uh, decolonial for reasons that uh, I will explain later, but I do understand what, uh, uh, what, what is trying to, what, what is a, a, a attempted here. Uh, I often say, however, that when you, uh, when you have a, a big debate or discussion as, as they, they had in Cape Town in South, South Africa over the Statue of Rhodes, that, um, that it is good uh, to tear down the Statue of Rhodes. Uh, of course, he was uh, one of the biggest races of all times. But uh, the question is then, if you want to represent something, then what do you do next? And that is a real question. And that's where Afrocentricity has often come in. It, 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 because Afrocentrists say, okay, well, you can, you can take down Europe uh, materially. You can even take down the uh, epistemes that have been developed by Europe. But what do you have that you can use to understand your own life? And that's where the assertion of agency on the part of Africans come from. But the only way that Africans can get this kind of assertion is to interrogate uh, the African past. And the interrogation of the African past has been delayed because what intervened was the European way of thinking that came in and stopped Africans 
from even inquiring into their life in the village <laughs> in a contemporary sense. One of my students from Nigeria came to me and said, you know, after listening to you, I'm going to go home and talk to my mother about the sacred places in our village. Because as we were educated, we were educated away from our own history and our own ancestors. So listening to you, I think I want to ask her these questions. And she went home and told her mother this and said, mother, I want you to take me to the shrines. I want you to tell me what's the history of our people. How do we come up with these things with agriculture and metallurgy and well, tell me about this. And the mother broke down and cried and said, my daughter who's gone to school in Switzerland and in Ohio has now come back to Nigeria and asked me the questions that I knew she would never ask me being educated in the West. I saw the same thing in South Africa, UNISA. People say, well, I teach agriculture. And to teach ag agriculture, I got to learn from the Western scholars who write about agriculture. I said, wait a minute. Where are you from? How long have Africans lived in this place? Didn't Africans plant? Didn't they harvest? You have you ever interrogated that? No, we haven't. So what has Europe done? Europe has imposed its own way as universal on everybody. Of course, the Chinese now, of course, are uh, competing for this with the Confucius Institutes all over Africa and everywhere. You see, because it's a, because it, it, they see it as a contest of ideas. But in all of this scramble for the African mind and for the minds of the world, the real question, as uh, uh, my friend C.K. Raju has always said, uh, is the real question is, do we interrogate ourselves in our own history and culture? Do we, as, as a, a, to, to add to knowledge and so on? So, so post-colonialism, uh, I, I understand what the, people mean by it. And I understand what people mean by decolonial. The, the, I have a big problem with, with it, and I'll mention it in a minute, uh, and I'll, I'll be finished with this. But po, po, I think post-colonial studies tried early on to interpret the impact of the, the inherited relationships that, uh, that have come from uh, uh, the imperial uh, regime of Europe uh, and to, and they've tried to explain contemporary political situations by looking back and saying, well, well, when the British or the French or the you know, Portuguese were here, these were the things that were left. I mean, so if you take the works by Grossfugel, uh, Mignola, or Inlovu, uh, Sabello uh, Inlovu, uh, one of the things you understand, they, they have added to our understanding of the structures of power, uh, uh, which have been often masked in the terms of gender or race or class or religion or nation state relationships. Uh, and, and they have pointed out, I believe that there are indeed bad guys and good guys. There, there are those who uh, seek to eliminate competition, uh, to, to deny human rights, to dominate the different. Uh, especially women, and to murder the lover of truth, uh, you know, and, and in that sense, they, they are, um, uh, 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 they're different from those who aim to enlighten the ignorant or to cause justice to flourish, elevate the poor, for example, or to preserve the environment. So post-colonial from its beginning was meant to evoke a, uh, a narrative, a discursive narrative about the historical role of imperialism in establishing today's power relationships. Uh, but my uh, issue with uh, post-colonial uh, 
is probably there are two two parts to it. One part is we are not post colonial in the first place. We we're not we we haven't gone beyond we haven't gone there. We we we're not we we're not uh, post anything. It's in the, it's still the same system, the same hegemony, right? This is um, uh, we are not uh, we, we we have decolonized in many respects, but uh, colonialism still exists. Secondly, we should not use colonialism. This is now I'm talking specifically about Africa. We should not use colonialism as a tag for periodizing African history. It was an intrusion. It was an invasion, an imperial enterprise of about 100, 150 years, even though the influence was longer than that, 500 years maybe. But, but, the, but the actual, uh, 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 for the most of Africa, with the exception of perhaps South Africa, uh, it was a, less than 150 years of, of being in Zimbabwe or being in uh, Ghana or Nigeria, you see. So, so the, these, this intrusion, this invasion, this imperial enterprise uh, in, in Africa really is small when you compare it to Africa's long history, the longest history in the world. And it is unwise to speak of post-colonial in reference to Africa. What has passed is what has passed, what has been overcome is the European political occupation of the continent. And that political occupation of the, of the continent was of course uh, 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 something that we can look back at now and say that it was uh, not only aberrant, but it was of course something that certainly did not uh, uh, help uh, African people in terms of uh, appreciating the the, 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 the possibilities uh, that were inherent in the original uh, structure of African society. Um, what we wanna know, I mean, that I think uh, is the same as I think about it as Afrocentrists, as even the post so-called so -called post-colonialists is how to unravel the state of the world. And this is a worthy thing. But I think that neither postmodernism nor postcolonialism can do this alone or with each other. Something more is needed. And that something more has been provided by the Afrocentrists who have been maligned because the ideas did not originate with Europe. Afrocentricity is not a white idea. That is a, the main problem why you have uh, not only white critics of it, but black critics of it. And you have black critics of it because black people also have been affected and victimized by the episteme of Europe. And part of that episteme, as you will see, uh, comes from what I call the racial ladder. So uh, uh, as, as, as African ideas, uh, 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 or an African idea, Afrocentrists Afro have challenged the imaginary structure of the racial ladder. Uh, forms of oppression, forms of repression are glued to the European project. As an Afrocentrist, I offer several observations. Uh, first, uh, as to postmodernism, it challenges the hierarchical order of the Western enterprise. Uh, Afrocentricity is a holistic theory of knowledge, a relocation of African cosmological and ontological thought of the most ancient civilizations. I seek uh, in my work, a paradigmatic demise of the Eurocentric, monolithic, racialist, uh, perspective of the world uh, that set that establishes Europe uh, as a model for uh, as a universal model of the world. But I also seek 
uh, an end to the race paradigm, which fuels the contemporary structure of the power relationships in the world. And this is seen really clearly in the United States of America. Kyle Rittinghouse's acquittal yesterday was met, as you would expect, in unison by most African Americans as an indication that a white teenager who shot and killed two people and injured a third with an AR-15 lone gun, that, that he would have had a hard time being convicted for killing whites who demonstrated against the killing of an unarmed black man, Jacob Blake. We saw that, we were like, oh, what is, what is this about? It's not about law. Law is a part of it. That's the protocol. But what it is about is a racial ladder. A 17-year-old Black man with a long gun shooting protesters, killing two of them, could never make a defense that he was defending himself and that his uh, that he was uh, using his gun in self-defense. That's a crazy thing to most black people. We, we, we say, Wait a minute. And why is it crazy? It's crazy because, hey, it only happens with white people. It's a, it's a Zimmerman situation with Trayvon Martin, you see, uh, who, 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 who can get away with killing black people or killing white people who are thought to, in the vernacular of the uh, American society, love black people. Those white people also are considered trash in the minds of the white people who are uh, white supremacists. So, so this is a uh, this is a contemporary issue. This uh, epistemological issue is a contemporary issue. Uh, uh, the, the jury's verdict in the case yesterday would never have gone that way for any young Black teenager because of the convergence of the European hegemony and the race paradigm itself. So, so Afrocentricity does not deny a, a center. We accept the notion of centeredness. Uh, but uh, this is, and it's unlike postmodernism in that regard because uh, um, uh, Afrocentricity asserts the equal value of a multiplicity of human possibilities, uh, the hum uh, many uh, human centers, you see. Afrocentricity is an assault on every form of racism, uh, patriarchy, oppression, repression, and is based on mutual respect of all people. That's a problem for a, uh, a, 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 a white racial, cultural, hegemonic, uh, imperialistic, dominating ideology. That is why Afrocentricity is a problem. Uh, it's grounded in two facts. The African origin of humanity and the African origin of civilization. I've told you that before, but I wanna, just explain now this racial ladder and I will be finished. Uh, the, the racial ladder uh, has been constructed, it seems to me, uh, over time by religions, by saints, sages, priests, uh, of all imperial religions. You take an imperial religion, you can definitely see the ranking of people by race. You can see the, the, the racial ladder. And, and it is so um, clear in history that the people who, can, who, who have been lighter, who consider themselves at the top, rank the people who are darkest at the bottom. And the black woman is at the very bottom of it. She's even, above, she's even below the black man. That, that's the way this ranking goes. White man at the top. And in between all these variations of color, that's, a, that's an imaginary ladder. It doesn't exist in, in, in reality. 
it, except in the minds of the people who are practicing it. That is the, the key here. The, you know, we, we, we have argued as social scientists a lot that, you know, the real issue is uh, race. The race is not a biological fact, okay? So we have to get rid of race. But the reason we can't get rid of racism is not so much in the word race itself, that there's something is, you know, that is not biologically a fact. The, the reason is because even if you got rid of the term race, what you have in the West is this conception of a racial ladder that's in the mind of almost every white person and almost every black person and every Indian and every Chinese in the world largely affected by the European spread of white domination. And I'm not saying that, they, that the Chinese and uh, the Indians are not affected because they are. I mean, you can just look at the Varna system in India and see definitely that it's, uh, it, they, they are affected by it as well. So, so this, this notion of ranking of human beings, which also leads us into this whole question of, uh, of dealing with now intersectionality from uh, critical race theory, is, is, is these, are all, these are all systems that are designed to obliterate the idea that we are all human being. We, being human being. Being human being, if you walk through my door into my office, I don't have to ask you uh, what your gender is or what your uh, sexuality is or what your class is. If I accept human beingness, then to me, that is all that matters. That is the way it was in the beginning. And so should it be now. That, that's the, that is our, our problem, you see? So if we um, uh, get rid of this, we condemn the race paradigm, we condemn the uh, racial ladder that we've written about, uh, Dove and I, and being human being, transforming the race discourse, uh, not just for asserting the idea of race, we, we, we were, but, but a cultural construct with no biological base, but for constructing the racial ladder itself, the imaginary idea that keeps generating what we call racist, racialist decisions. That, that is our problem. Something that uh, uh, in Europe, uh, we've dealt with uh, uh, for several centuries, beginning with the Germans and the English. Von Humboldt and Darwin, for example, were key actors. We all remember that Darwin's book, uh, The Origin of Species, uh, had a subtitle, The Preservation of the Favorite Races. White to the top and Blacks at the bottom. So I just want to stop here uh, and uh, just say that, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open for any conversation. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Asante. I echo Vishna in the chat that this was a very insightful and inspiring talk. Thank you so much. I will now give over to Prof. Makoli to start the conversation. Yes. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Asante. Uh, I want to explore a couple of ideas with you and then we can see where we go from there. Am I correct uh, in reading your work? And I was also reading um, Montero Ferreira's book that you are saying that Afrocentricity is to some extent homo sapiens centric. Would you agree with such an interpretation of Afrocentricity? It, 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 is, it, is homo, it is homo sapiens centric. Well, well, I would, I would, I would think that uh, if I understand uh, you correctly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that it is definitely centered on the idea uh, mm -hmm. that comes from Sheikh Anta's joke. Mm -hmm. uh, who argues in his book, The African Origin of mm -hmm. Civilization, and also in his book, 
civilization of barbarism. Yes. Uh, the, the, that, the, uh, that the earliest uh, notions <clears throat> of uh, how human beings have existed and lived on the earth was found with uh, with the, with the, with the woman that that uh, that uh, uh, the notion not just matrilineality but matriarchy was itself at the very beginning and mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, interesting for us to explore not just the woman centeredness but for it, for us to explore the whole idea of how the transfer came mm -hmm. in human knowledge, where we got patriarchy. And patriarchy, mm -hmm. and, and, and matriarchy should not be understood as a counterpart uh, to uh, patriarchy, but, mm -hmm. but, but rather that, uh, uh, that it was a complementary system, you see? Mm -hmm. And this is a different thing, I mean, uh, from what was it, what came into existence. So I would agree with you, but what came into existence as a, a patriarchy that was hierarchical and was mm -hmm. oppressive and repressive, that, that, that system, the system that we have inherited and that has been mm -hmm. maintained by the West was not an African system. It does mm -hmm. not exist. It, it, it only exists in Africa after the coming of the Arabs and the coming of the, of the Europeans. It is not an African system. The, the, the woman is at the center mm -hmm. of the African system. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we began as Afrocentrists mm -hmm. to, to probe that and to look at that, we can see exactly precisely how this came into being. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, right. And then um, there is, uh, on page 15 of um, the Demis of the Inhuman, um, um, Montero Ferreira writes, and I think this is quite consistent with your argument, based on the Martian ethics, Afrocentric theory of knowledge embraces a conception of a shared world of plural perspectives without hegemony. Can yes. Sort of, yes. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Mm -hmm. I will be very happy to, because that is, uh, and and uh, um, she 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 learned very well from one of my earlier books, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea of pluralism without harm. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. that essentially uh, what the Afrocentric uh, position takes is a, a position that says that. Uh, we all and, and, I, and I think that it comes out in the in the work that I've done with Dove that we mm -hmm. debated these things and worked through these things that uh, as human beings, regardless to what your culture is, it's a cultural issue. You see, it's mm -hmm. not a um, it's not a biological issue or mm -hmm. a racial issue. It's a cultural issue. You can have uh, you can have a person who uh, may look biologically, I mean, if you think of that, how big they look, people look all kinds of ways, but, but let me just take it, let me just make it more concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, Clarence, uh, Clarence Thomas, who mm -hmm. is the Supreme Court judge of the United States, is considered a black man. But <laughs> by all cultural, all cultural indicators, he's a white man. But if you look at him, you see, you see, you think, that's a black man. That culturally, he's not black. So, 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 what does that mean? You can also find white people who are culturally Indian, or you can find uh, Indians who are culturally European. So, all this is so it's a cultural issue. So, for me, I accept all human beings without hierarchy. That's okay. the essential notion. But what Europe imposed, mm -hmm. and, um, and many of the religions imposed, mm -hmm. was this notion of hierarchy, you see? Mm -hmm. And hierarchy is problematic. Any, anyway, there's, there's no human beings who are, I mean, if you're a human being, basically, there, there are some, there, there are many, there, there are so, 
there are 99.9% similarities. They're, they're all human beings. But, <laughs> but our cultures can be different, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, let me continue with this. Uh, from your vast experience of uh, exp uh, through your exposition of uh, Afrocentricity, et cetera, um, are there any studies by white students in which they are using Afrocentricity to analyze white or European behavior. Uh, are there some students who have said, OK, yeah. fine, let, let's go and study how the Scottish behave using Afrocentricity? Wow, mm -hmm. that wow. is a, you've given me a, you've given me a, uh, uh, I, I'm going to suggest that to one of my students next week. <laughs> that, is a, that is a very, that is a very powerful, uh, thought. I don't think I, most of our, I mean, I, I have a white student now, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chris Viscuso, but Chris is actually studying black culture. So, <laughs> so, so, but the study, but, but, but the study of the white culture, it, yes. I think would be a really profound work. I mean, no, we, mm -hmm. we don't have that yet. But but okay. I'm sure it will come. That's a that's a, a, a powerful idea. I appreciate that. Mm, mm, okay. Unless okay. Doctor now Doctor Dove is on. Unless Doctor Dove knows. Yes, Doctor Dove. Yes, Doctor Dove. Yes. But does she know one of her students? I'm, Dr. I'm Dove. definitely working on it. But Anna Ferrero. Yeah. Is a, is an example. You're reading her work. Yes. She's mm -hmm. an example, and uh, you know. Uh, um, a role model for the students who will come because they're mm -hmm. getting it. We have white students getting into the discipline and understanding the freedom that it gives them to mm -hmm. step outside the race paradigm. Okay. And, okay. you know, she offers leadership in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah. So that's what, and, and Anna, Anna, Anna did that. She, she, she made that path and, uh, uh, she was, of course, schooled uh, originally uh, early on in Europe, and she was grounded in the uh, postmodernism. And so mm -hmm. she came to Afrocentricity. She saw for the first time an I idea that she thought was uh, that really that uh, should be more widely known. And it, had it not been had it not been for for me calling it Afrocentricity, if I had called it something else. It would have been a different mm. idea. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I see what you mean. But but the idea yes. was that it was based on the fact that Homo sapiens originated in Africa, and that yes. was the first civilization. So that's why I call it Afrocentricity. But mm. if I had said centricity or something, then yeah. maybe 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 I would have had uh, many more people not to attack me. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. You know, but, but the but the attack, but but Professor Bacconi, but the attack on Afrocentricity is a part mm. of the racial ladder itself. Yes. You know I mean? Yes. It is yes. because can black people theorize? Can black yes. people yes. Uh, yes. come up with theories yes. that white people don't know anything about? That that's a whole yes. different. So you say no, they're at the bottom of the ladder. They can't. There's no way possible yes. that this can be a legitimate yes. idea. Yes. You see. Yes, that's that's true. That um, even in the American Academy, the the black professors, I mean, they just practice. They can't theorize. They can't come up with yes. new ideas that's right. which that's we can right. learn, which we can learn from. No, that, they, that is not possible. That's in, right. in, in 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 applied linguistics, the argument would be. They just are practitioners. That's they can right. Right. Yes, right. yes. I mean, you, you, under, you understand yeah. precisely my point. Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. 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 I mean, they yes, they, they they just do those minor things. I mean, anyway. And, <laughs> yeah. And then the the other thing that is uh, really interesting about um, Afrocentricity, for example, you talk about the dialogical methodology. And um, in, on page 32 of Anna Ferreira's book, she writes that this is very interesting. Until lions can tell their tale, 
the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. But I... <laughs> well, 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 she she's quoting she's quoting from an old African prophet. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. But until they until they can I mean until lions can tell their own tale, the the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So you will never get to know how the other animals were dodging or <laughs> running running around these people in circles. That's <laughs> right. right. That's right. right. That's and right. then she proceeds in a very interesting and concrete way. She then argues, I mean, illustrates that methodologically, for example, she argues Afrocentricity is centered in terms of location, time, place, and stance are the points of reference from which a cultural and philosophical and historical analysis can be uh, conducted. What I like about that is that she gets into a, a big philosophical discussion, but then she goes down and she's very concrete about if you were trying to do this, this is how you yes. could proceed. Yes, right. it's a method. So, yes. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. And, 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 and we and, and we argue that now one of the one of the points, uh, Professor McConnell, that I didn't go mm -hmm. into uh, deeply, and I it was um, a few a years ago now, maybe fifteen or twenty years ago, I, I was in a debate with uh, my friend Cornell West at uh, yes yes, yes. Uh, in Ohio at Dayton. I think it was at uh, United uh, Theological Seminary, and they, mm -hmm. they had us having a debate. And he, he said to me, he said, Molefi is, uh, he said, Molefi is interested in place. And he's interested in centeredness. But, uh, but coming from the postmodern view, I am interested in fluidity. You mm -hmm. see? So, so when I had to respond, I said to him uh, and to the audience, uh, I don't have a problem with fluidity, mm -hmm. but everything comes from somewhere yes. so you have to be at some you have to have some posture you know mm -hmm. and then you can do you you can do you can be fluid you can yes. have a, i mean th there are certain in, in our lives there are many uncertainties yes, yes. We, can't, we can't take a, a modernist position that everything is um is based on structure and reason and 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 and, uh, and and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. you know, day is day, and night is night. We we have to understand though that you have to have a point of beginning, mm -hmm. and that point of beginning, the, from there you 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 are open to all possibilities. Mm -hmm. that, that is, mm -hmm. and I think that's the same thing that uh, 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 Ferrer uh, would say. Yes, yes, and. Um... That's why also your discussion about uh, Afrocentricity and the issue about holism that in the sort of African conception, these, all these things um, tie together. Um, mm -hmm. with what postmodernism does, intentional or unintentional, is to fragment everything. Yes, of course. Uh, it's to fragment yes. everything. And, yes. Yeah, the impulse of your know, Afrocentricity seems to be to go the other way around, that to, to, to go to the other extent that, no, look here, uh, you need to look at these things in terms of how they are interwoven, interconnected to become uh, a bigger uh, whole, so to speak. Yes, yes. Right, yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, 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 that is correct, Professor mm. McCauley, because mm. what, what, I am, uh, what I'm examining often mm is uh, this uh, uh, how we put how we how we put things uh, together again because mm -hmm. uh, uh, Europe what I, Europe has many uh, uh, talents and many skills mm -hmm. Europe has uh, has done many uh, wonderful things and and one of the things that uh, probably helped advance European science to some degree was this notion of classification and they were they are expert at the that idea of classification and in, in, in the uh, 16th 17th and 18th century they tried to classify everything and they, they that's that's one of the, the talents of europe but the problem with that for for africa is that in many ways in african society 
Uh, you can't separate, for example, agriculture <clears throat> from uh, from religion. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you 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 cannot um, make these uh, uh, separations because they they are all a part of the same process and, yeah. and the same thing. I mean, uh, you you if you made these discrete separations, you wouldn't understand anything. Because mm. this is a, it's a, it's a, everything is a part of everything. We yeah. are a part of everything. Yeah. Human beings, we all human beings are part of, uh, uh, the trees are part of everything. Yes. In, in, in Ghana, mm. uh, where I've done work, uh, you, you would hear, have the dramas would go out to the forest. Mm -hmm. And before they cut a tree down, mm -hmm. they would, they would give a, 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 a praise song to the tree. Mm -hmm. that you, I know you are living. You are a living thing. Mm -hmm. I'm a part of you. But mm -hmm. I just need you to be in another form. And I'm going to mm -hmm. cut you down to make this drum. That, that's a whole different response to ecology and yeah. to the environment that we would get in the West. We say, well, tree, <laughs> trees, you know, is so totally separate from us. They don't have anything to do with us. You know? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Let me give over to Chanel and then she can invite everybody else. I saw that Sally Coco wanted to ask. Uh, Chanel, um, the, I'm handing over to you. I'll, to, I'll get back later on, yeah. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so um, we I'm going, giving over to Tebojo. Tibok, if you would like to ask your question. Um, Tibok? Oh, Are yes, you? I was just okay. unmuting. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to Prof, uh, thank you to organizers and uh, attendants. Um, I highly appreciate uh, Prof Asante's uh, clarification of his position and his appreciation of uh, both forces, that is the force of hegemony and oppression, and, uh, and the possibility of Africa, uh, Afrocentrism and probably empowering people who, are, who have been uh, oppressed and whose knowledge has been overlooked or even suppressed. Um, my perception is that the biggest problem at the moment is racism. Yes, it has historical roots, um, but the way I see the solution in the racism is to both enhance the power of Afrocentrism together with all the other South that is oppressed and that the, this unity should fight in the manner of both intellectual, psychological change and legal uh, change such as Martin Luther King's civil rights movement and other. I am an African, I'm, I'm a Pan-Africanist, but I'm also an American. So I, I would like to live in a society which is fair, which has equality. And I see that as the biggest problem. So I refer back to the past only to find out which forces can help to transform these Euro-American perceptions, racism and oppression, to change them to accept equality of, of people from both Africa and, and the South altogether. So I want the Prof to, to try and speak to... Okay. What is the future solution to this problem as I see it myself? I see it as the, the problem of changing the mentality of um, the powers that be in, in Africa, Afro, in Euro America, mm -hmm. and their perception <coughs> to understand equality and accept it. And, uh, and therefore, after that, we can, we can live happily ever after. <laughs> okay, thank, it's thank not, you. It's not uh, easy. They, but, they will, they will yes. thank you so much. I, I appreciate I appreciate your your comment and your and your question, and uh, and it for and for me, of course, it's um, it, it's it's one of these uh, questions that 
for many years, I, I asked the same question <laughs> that you asked, right? And that's why I think I kept working to, to come to what I consider to be a way to deal with it. Uh, because if you live in a, uh, in a uh, uh, racist society, all institutions are touched by racism. I mean, if you live in the United States of America or in the UK, for example, uh, all the institutions are touched by it. I mean, they, they're touched by this thing. So you, you want to know as a, as a scholar, I mean, uh, what, what, how do we resolve this issue? How can we deal with this issue? I wrote a book many years ago, 20 years ago now called Erasing Racism, The Survival of the American Nation. It was a very popular book at the time. And, um, and but I, I've, I've gone, I've come so far away from that uh, idea because that idea was based, I think on uh, 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 the predicate here in your question, that idea was based on the idea that you can transform human beings by somehow teaching them that we are all equal um, and that racism, uh, that, that you should not look at race and so forth. But I've come to see that that's not the way uh, that it works. The way, way it works, I believe, uh, uh, Taboho, is something like this. The way it works is that uh, in, in, a, in a society that establishes itself as our American society did on somebody else's territory, first of all, the indigenous people, right? The, you, you, you come in, you set up, a polity on, on the land of the people who are already there, and you create rules and regulations and laws and a constitution and say that we now, the new people who've come here, we represent a, a new polity and the old polity and all what all you uh, Cherokee and, uh, and Seminole and uh, Muscogee and uh, Wabanaki and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, other people are doing, th that That doesn't matter. And in fact, not only does it not matter, we will kill you. We will eliminate you in order to advance our particular polity. And in fact, that's why you have mostly the elimination. Uh, at one time, it was only about uh, four or 500,000 of the indigenous people still left in this country. Fortunately, they had grown back. Uh, to, to over three to four million now, but it was they, they just wiped out. There were campaigns to kill them, and there were there were uh, 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 there. If you killed a Native American and brought the scalp, uh, you could get acres of land for that. You see, so that was one of the patterns in New England and in Florida, uh, near where I was born in in, in, in South Georgia. Uh, Andrew Jackson set it up so that if a white person went and killed a Seminole and brought back the ears of the Seminole, then you get 160 acres of land. That's how the whites settled uh, Florida. In, in Texas, uh, the idea was uh, when, they, uh, when, the, when the whites came and took over Texas, which was Mexico, which was part of Mexico's territory, uh, they wanted to bring in uh, a, a slavery in, into Texas. And Mexico, with its uh, uh, first president, who was a black man, Vicente Guerrero, in 1829, had outlawed slavery in Mexico. So the Americans bring slavery into Mexico. And then there's the big battle of the, of the Alamo. Well, that battle was because the whites wanted to protect slavery. And the Mexican government in Mexico City says, no, this is Mexico. You can't bring what you had in Louisiana over here into Texas. This is a total different thing. Of course, the ultimate uh, result of that was that uh, the whites won in the end and took half of Mexico's territory, including California and Colorado and so forth. I'm giving you this background to say that, so how do you deal with this issue? You deal with this issue not, I think, on the basis of the question of, well, 
race and uh, biological issues of race and so on. It's that uh, you have to destroy the imaginary racial ladder that gives white people a sense that any in any event, whether it is an event at Penn State or at Temple or at the University of Lagos, wherever it is, that they, because they are white, by virtue of their whiteness, they are at the top of the ladder. You have to destroy that. You don't have to destroy the white person. You just have to destroy the imagination in the white person's mind and in the black person's mind and in the Asian's mind, that that is total rubbish. So that's why in the African-American community, we are insisting that black people confront all examples of the racial ladder. You cannot, this is why Kyle Rittenhouse was, she shows you clearly another, another example, you see, that, that, that the, 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 the assumption that a white man who kills white people who, who is protesting to, pro, he's protesting because a black man had been killed by the police, an unarmed black man. That's why those protesters were out there. And those protesters were shot well, but they, they were people who had, in a sense, de decided that culturally they were for a more progressive society. And that is what we have to do. So I, I, don't, um, I don't think that uh, 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 talking about equality, uh, 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 you know, uh, even talking about justice, I think those are good issues and there will be people who will keep those battles going. But the real battle would be every instance where you see an example of the racial ladder, it has to be attacked. I just saw a beautiful documentary uh, two days ago uh, that uh, Kaepernick uh, made, uh, that actually uh, uh, Ava uh, Duvernay made, the film made, on uh, Kaepernick's life and growing up in life. And you see it very clearly then that this, this young black man raised by a white family, adopted and raised by a white family, is involved in situations that the family does not even understand what's going on, don't understand why he's angry and upset. They, they, they don't see the racism against him. They don't see that a white uh, 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 person, uh, a young uh, teenager can go and, and get an apple from a basket and no one says anything. And if he gets an apple from a basket, he's put out of the place. So, so it's, a whole, it's a whole construction. And that construction is the thing that, to me, uh, has to be dealt with most. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Sante. Um, Professor McQueen? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Asante, for presenting a clear and concise picture of Afrocentricity. And at the core of the message, as I get it, we all have to fight against uh, Eurocentrism. Yes. And this fight that is more global than Africa. Yes. And in a way, um, Asia has been engaged in it, um, especially the Chinese, uh, regarding, for instance, the evolution of mankind and the position of East Asia in this. In this. And that is really all welcome. And I'm glad that in your presentation, you reflected that you have been paying attention to all these evolutions in this fight. And I'm very grateful that you have carried on in the tradition of Che Kanta Job and you know, reminding us you know, of where we should go in order to reposition Africa in the history of mankind. And one thing that I particularly appreciated this morning is your questioning post-colonialism. Um, I have had this question, uh, discussed this question with my wife who is in the audience too. Um, so about a month ago, we were having a conversation and I said, you know, 
there's something wrong with postcolonialism, especially when it comes from North America. Yes. Because the United States in particular is still colonial. <laughs> the people that invaded North America have kept, have set a world order that belongs to them. And people think of the United States mostly as a white country and not as a Native American country, a Native American territory. And so if people have to speak of post-colonialism, they would have to look outside the Americas. Thank and you go to Africa, you have a certain semblance of post-colonialism in reality because the white rulers have left. But as you have also made so clear, you don't need a white ruler to maintain colonialism. Absolutely. And so that has continued in some other ways in Africa and intellectually, we are all trapped in that. And we have to start by emancipating ourselves as intellectuals in proposing alternatives. So about three years ago, somebody invited me to contribute to a, vol a volume titled Decolonial Linguistics. And my first reaction in reading the papers that I had to comment on was, my gosh, for the past 30 years, I have been engaged in decolonial linguistics without knowing it. It sounds like Jourdain, uh, in the Bourgeois Jean Guillaume saying, I've been speaking prose all my life and I didn't know. <laughs> okay. On the other hand, I think every approach like yours uh, that questions the received doctrine needs refining. And what I find confusing is the way in which you keep referring to Africa. And to me, it's not clear whether the Africa before the exodus of homo sapiens out of Africa was the same or similar to Africa today in terms of people, in terms of uh, cultures. So how are we supposed to, how are we expected to think of pre-Exodus Africa, didn't that Africa have ancestors of the same people that left Africa and the people that later on returned to Africa and so forth. We, I think we need a clearer picture of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think during the presentation, you didn't mention black, but in answering some of the questions Africa became confused with Black Africa. And that is something that to me needs clarifying. And at some point you spoke, for instance, of African domesticating the cow. Well, I think the domestication of the cow comes with the invention of agriculture. And you did refer to African practices in agriculture and so forth, and it's all welcome. But there's the Africa post-exodus, not the Africa pre-exodus. So we have a problem with periodization there. And I, I think that you would gain a lot of mileage in you know, uh, developing Afrocentricity in clarifying the way in which you refer to Africa. And for me, born in Africa, raised in Africa, Africa is diverse, even among the Blacks. And that's not really against your approach, because your approach is very open to diversity, to variation, but also points attention to respect of the other and points attention to some sort of egalitarianism. And that is all welcome. But, you know, it would really help if you could unpack Africa and, you know, point out specifically to the kinds of things that we should pay attention to 
and 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 situate in the right uh, periods of history. That's my reaction. Well, I think I really appreciate that, uh, uh, Professor uh, Salicoco. You know, I, uh, I I I I'm familiar with your work, and certainly I appreciate uh, all the work that you've done uh, in, in, in your field. And I, I appreciate your comments as well. And, and I would like to just uh, take up a, a couple of them, the ones that I can remember and, and, and see uh, where we are. Uh, for, first of all, um, uh, Afrocentricity is not a, a counterpart to Eurocentricity. Uh, Euro Eurocentrism, as I see it, uh, is an ethnocentric position uh, of uh, the hegemony of the white race. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that. I mean, it is possible that people can be Eurocentric and, uh, and at the same time not uh, uh, hegemonic. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with the Eurocentric culture. I mean, if you're born in Europe and you have uh, your European traditions and values and so forth, that that, that is uh, that that should not be a problem. The the problem is the um, uh, the the European um, attempt uh, to uh, dominate uh, other cultures and other ways of life. So so if Europe, for example, uh, took itself as itself, uh, there, there's no problem with that. But then if you say, for example, that ballet is classical dance and that, uh, uh, that, there, that there is no Akan uh, classical dance, uh, then you have a problem uh, with me because uh, ballet is maybe European classical dance, uh, but the Kete in Kumasi is a royal classical dance as well. So, so, so the idea that Europe imposes itself as if it is universal, that is Europe's problem. And that's why we say Afrocentricity does not impose itself as if the culture of Africa, uh, as it is uh, interpreted today, it should be imposed on everybody. We say that the values that the early African people had on the continent, and I'll come to that in a minute, that the, those values that we see early on in African civilization are values that did not have the ranking of people by difference. It's the ranking of people by difference that allows Europe to create this imaginary racial ladder in their brains and to put that in the brains of other people so that people walk around, if they see a black person, they have a particular view of, of that person. A young black teenager walking the streets of a city uh, has a, uh, 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 creates a different reaction than a young white person walking the same streets. And that's because there is this notion of the ranking of uh, people on the basis of their biology. And that's, the, I mean, the, the black person may be a Clarence Thomas walking the street. So you wouldn't have it, you know, you, I mean, it, it, you can't go by that. You can't go by biology. And that's what we have to confront all the time. Now, the question of Africa, you have raised a very good question. Here's a question about Africa. There are 7 billion people on the earth today. According to biology, all of them are Africans. That is, everybody on the face of the earth today uh, has DNA that comes from uh, the earliest African woman that they could discover. She has given all of us her DNA. So in that sense, the, 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 the world is populated by African, uh, by DNA that comes from the earliest homo sapiens. Was in Africa. There's no when when people left Africa, uh, th th their DNA was still African. It was still from the continent of Africa. They had been. You, you get the rise of humanity in East Africa, and 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 humanity spread throughout Africa first, spread throughout the continent of Africa, and then left the continent of Africa. But the DNA is the same. 
it is so that's why we don't deal necessarily with biology but with culture but what happens is that our cultures are different and our cultures are often different by our environment uh, I mean, you know, for example, I mean, I was always always fascinated as a young person to see that, uh, and 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 please, uh, please, uh, this is this is my own personal thing. Uh, 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 I know a lot of people love dogs, right? Well, <laughs> it, I grew up in South Georgia. We had I had a dog, but the dog was outside. Dog didn't sleep in my bed. The dog didn't stay in my house. The dog was outside. But Europe had a special relation. I never understood the special relationship with the dog until I, I heard someone say that um, in, in, in a cold climate in Europe, that perhaps what the people would do with, at the cave, at the entrance to the cave, they would build a fire and they would have their dog there to protect the fire. So someone could not steal the fire. Someone could not put the fire out. So the dog became known as man's best friend. We don't have that experience in Africa. That is a whole different kind of relationship to a, to a dog, you see? So environment, uh, your, uh, you know, if you live on an island, it's different from if you live perhaps on a massive uh, mainland. So I, 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 I hear you about uh, making, uh, clarifying this notion of African, but I don't use the term black African. My, my, um, my mentor, Sheikh Anta Joe, used that term, black Africa, and he used it as an emphasis. It was emphatic for him to use it, to say that the ancient Egyptians were black Africans. And he had to say that in his words, because otherwise, Europeans would think that the ancient Egyptians were Arabs. So he said, no, they were black Africans, just like the Senegalese, just like the Guineans, just like the Ghanaian, these were black Africans. So I don't use the term black Africa because Africa, we don't say white Europe. We don't necessarily say yellow, yellow Asia I, or brown Asia. I think that, I think that uh, Africa, what, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, population, in terms of uh, the complexion of Africa is great, very diverse. It's probably the most diverse continent on the face of the earth. And that's part of why the DNA of Africa is everywhere. It's very, very diverse. And there are all kinds, I've been all, all over the continent, all kinds of people in Africa, all kinds of languages in Africa. So uh, this notion of blackness, and, and uh, uh, I think, um, it is we have to be careful about uh, the, the black, uh, blackness in that sense, because uh, the, uh, the, the movement out of Africa obviously brought about more differentiation in, the, in how humans look, but, uh, but, but it's a cultural part that I think is much more important than anything else. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, Professor Dapp, did you want to say something? Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to Dr. Asante's uh, work and ideas, just to bring in the cultural piece, because I noticed um, that, uh, let me see, I noticed that Dr. Mufweni um, had sort of touched upon the concept of evolution and that there's a certain evolutionist European way and Arabic way of looking at African people. So there's a sort of area and time when African people are supposed to be primitive. So there's the idea that people leave, leaving Africa became more civilized. Um, but there are thousands of years where, you know, in our discoveries, uh, we found that African scientists uh, who could plot the movement of the planets and uh, so on and so forth, um, had just been looked at as actual primitive people who knew nothing, did nothing and just barely survived when actually they are scientists amongst many, um, uh, um, 
skills that they had, and they have laid the groundwork for today's scientists. So we have to reevaluate what we're saying when we're looking at Africa from a primitive European perspective. And the other thing I wanted to add is that, of course, there are many people in Africa, but many of them are conquerors who've imposed their cultural beliefs and values upon Afri African people. So within Africology, we actually look at cultural differences and cultural similarities. And we found those things that enable us to use Geopian ideas of culture from that perspective, not the anthropological perspective, but from Diop's perspective to use culture as a tool of analysis so that we can step outside the race paradigm and reevaluate what's actually going on in Africa. Who are the people who understand the ancient traditions or the source of ideas that can be used in today's politics? And who are the people that have are there really to take from Africa its wealth and undermine the people who are there and use the people who are there to regain this type of wealth? So there are cultural differences in Africa through enemies of Africa. So we have to be you know, careful to analyze these cultural differences. I just wanted to add that, not to make it complex, but I noted some inferences from what you said. So thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Dav. Um, Professor Mufwene, two minutes. Yes, I, I really appreciate your contribution, Professor Dov. And for the rest of the audience, I invite you to do an exercise, Go Google, the evolution of mankind and look at the images and the representation goes from darker complexion to lighter complexion to from um, uh, the image that is an image that is closer to the uh, uh, chimps to an image that is more and more Caucasian. I have often started public presentations with that image and invited people to tell me if they saw anything wrong in the representation. And my audience is generally predominantly white in North America. Nobody ever notices that until I point it out to them. And then the other thing is I ask them, is there anything else that you can notice? And they don't point, notice it. And I say, it's all male. And that is very interesting. You'll find a number of things that, that carry on the prejudice since yes. uh, the 19th century. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thanks, Professor Mufwene. Um, I will now take a question by Ashraf. Um, thanks for the lucid presentation. Is there any difference between your conception of Afrocentricity and Pan-Africanism as a political movement? And also, how do you relate African Afrocentricity to Southern theory? Well, uh, yes, I, I'm going to uh, uh, the the um, the question of uh, uh, Afrocentricity and Pan Africanism is almost like a uh, a vehicle and an engine. I think Pan Africanism, uh, without uh, Afrocentricity is uh, a vehicle. I mean, it is, uh, it, it may even be very much a slogan, uh, but it does not have a core. Uh, the core of it, and if you're talking about Pan-Africanism as a movement for the unity of African people and for bringing into existence the United States of Africa or for bringing into existence some sort of common uh, African uh, project uh, the only way that could happen is that uh, African people who are engaged in that are on the same page. And if they're not on the same page uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, historical uh, sensibilities and uh, episteme, uh, then uh, you will not have a Pan-Africanism that functions. Uh, you know, because the Pan-Africanism, I mean, right now, I mean, the the, the general idea was that Pan-Africanism was fundamentally based on um, uh, the uh, idea of um, uh, uh, actually uh, the, the core of it was 
uh, uh, set by African uh, uh, intellectuals who were socialists. So the, the, the original idea was that uh, it should be a socialist Pan-Africanism or a socialist Africa. That was uh, George Padmore, who was a leading intellectual in this idea. I wrote a book on this last year, which is called an Af Afrocentric Pan-Africanist Vision. So if people are interested, it's called an Afrocentric Pan-Africanist vision, okay. Um, thanks, uh, Professor Santi. Um, yes, um, there's a discussion going on in the chat um, that was um, initiated by um, Sangeeta um, that, she, that says that she's wondering where the spin-off discussions are taking place in terms of Asia centrism, South American centrism and so forth. Um, and um, very interesting discussions between her and Lynn Maria de Sosa and Cecile uh, Vigoro. Um, so please go in and, and look at that. Um, I will now ask Professor uh, Marconi to just um, summarize for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank everybody for finding time on a Saturday to attend this uh, worthwhile um, forum. Um, I think uh, Professor Asante and the conversation with uh, Sally Koko, I think highlight some of the issues that we've been trying to grapple with. The one that I think is quite interesting, which um, we need to continuously think about is about the United States as a settler colony, right? That once you begin to think about the United States as a settler colony, then the issues about decoloniality and post-coloniality uh, will assume a very different shape. Because you then you quickly realize that you are, if you're in North America, particularly in the United States, you are still within a very strong settler uh, colony. And then you begin to see connections, let's say, between different parts of the world. That, like, for example, when Ian Smith in Rhodesia, for example, was trying to set up the unilateral declaration of Zimbabwe, of Rhodesia at that time, mm. was to some extent, the United States was his model. I mean, he wanted to take over a country belonging to other people, uh, as, the, uh, as the white Americans have done here. So it is those connections that I think we need to keep making. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I think the argument that um, Professor Asante has been making up between the connections between, let's say, um, some ideas in decoloniality and Afrocentricity. I think that is important for us to keep thinking across these different ideas and work out where we think there are compatibilities, where we think there are differences and that. Because I think this is a very important project to keep um, thinking about. Thank you very much, Professor Sanders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really Thank enjoy it. Very, very, mm. very, very dynamic and very powerful. And I appreciate mm. everything. Thank mm. you so much. I'm sorry I have to run, but I appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for Thank finding the time. Yeah. Bye bye. Mm. Bye bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>